Thanks so much for joining us today uh, at the Rice, Oil, and Gas Conference. My name is Steve Meserve. I am a Product Marketing Manager at IBM. And we're really excited to bring you a topic today concerning quantum. Uh, quantum is widely considered what's next in computing and obviously has huge implications for high performance computing. IBM is one of the leading companies doing research in this area. And we thought it'd be a really interesting topic to bring together one of our quantum experts who's on the line now and several folks from industry, uh, both research and uh, enterprises out there to have a discussion about quantum and its implications for oil and gas and, and energy broadly. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we'll start with a brief discussion from uh, IBM side. Uh, I have Mark Mattingly Scott on the line, uh, who I'll introduce further in a second, who's gonna talk about our quantum efforts and what quantum means uh, in oil and gas. And then we'll bring in some of our industry folks who are going to have an open discussion with Mark about what this means for all of our daily work. Uh, so with that, I want to pass it off to Mark. Uh, Mark is uh, the IBM's quantum ambassador lead for EMEA and the Asia Pacific region and has pretty extensive knowledge in this area. So he's a great person to bring on. Mark, I'll pass it off to you. Okay. Thanks very much, Stephen. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, so let's... Uh... Let's see if the, the gods of screen sharing work properly. Okay, that looks good. Um, so I wanted to just kick off with a little bit of background on um, on what quantum computing is. Um, and uh, I think the, the probably the fastest way to do that is to take a look inside a quantum computer, inside one of IBM's quantum chips. Um, the technology that IBM is using for quantum computing is um, something called uh, superconducting Josephson junctions. Um, this is basically a method where a small cloud of electrons, actually it's not so small, it's, uh, it's, uh, the number is still quite large, but, but uh, actually quite a small number of electrons in the superconducting state behave as if they were one electron. And uh, as Paul Dirac uh, proved uh, just after the Second World War, um, the simplest quantum mechanical system is the uh, is is the spin of an electron. So we've discovered a way, or we've we have a way to basically uh, simulate this very very simple quantum mechanical system using lots of electrons, uh, which uh, which we can then manipulate using microwaves to cause them to change their state to uh, enter superposition. Um, and we can also uh, cause qubits to interact with each other, to entangle with each other. Um, so we have two basic operations for qubits, um, which we're able to implement in hardware. Um, and that forms the basis of uh, basically um, a way to do what we call universal quantum computing. Um, the qubits are noisy, so uh, we can't get them. We can't get the qubits down to absolute zero. We can get them down to about somewhere between ten and fifteen millikelvin. Um, they have a a finite coherence time, so after a certain amount of time, they lose their quantum state and just turn into noise. But nevertheless, um, as long as we can, uh, as long as we can access and manipulate them <clears throat> during the time they are coherent, uh, then we have a way to implement quantum gates, and thus we can write quantum circuits or quantum programs. Uh, that's the basis of the technology. Um, if we look at the application areas for quantum computing, then they basically fall into three broad areas. Um, the first is where quantum, the idea of quantum computing actually comes from. Um, so the, back in the very, very early days of quantum computing, or the idea of um, using quantum mechanical systems for com quantum computation was kind of born back in the 60s and 70s, but the real breakthrough came in the early 80s um, when Richard Feynman proved that there were problems in physics which were uh, computationally inefficient on a classical computer and computationally efficient if we were able to use a quantum mechanical computer to solve them. Um, and that really started the the race the race was on to actually build qubits and quantum computers and i can remember back in 1985 when i was finishing my phd that that dates me somewhat 
um, reading in the, uh, I, I think it was the IEEE or ACM, one of the transactions about a group in Japan who just succeeded in implementing uh, qubits with a coherence time measured in femtoseconds. We're now in the 2000 and 2010s and 2020s. We have, uh, we have uh, significantly more qubits, over 100 qubits, and coherence times are measured in hundreds of microseconds with this technology. So we've come a long way. Um, the original idea of Feynman and others was to use a qubits to simulate physical properties uh, of, of matter, uh, either the physics of atoms or, by extension, molecules, pharmaceutical molecules, small molecules, large molecules. Um, and this is kind of the first area where we see quantum computing um, holding some significant promise. The second area is in the area of uh, artificial intelligence. There are a number of uh, algorithms which were developed um, basically starting in the 1990s from a computational complexity and the computational theoretical point of view. Um, most of them based on the assumption that we have what are called uh, error-free quantum computers. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and uh, these, these algorithms represent perhaps uh, a way to significantly speed up some algebraic problems, um, which lie at the heart of a lot of uh, machine intelligence and artificial intelligence uh, methods. And the third area is in the area of optimization, Monte Carlo methods, where we're already seeing um, algorithms which have been developed for the noisy quantum computers we have today, um, where we can demonstrate at least quadratic speed up, um, maybe even more. So these are the three main areas uh, where we expect to see quantum computers being used. If we look at the, the technology itself, um, IBM has um, uh, announced and launched and made available to um, companies in our IBM quantum network uh, machines with uh, 65, uh, 27 qubits and 65 qubits. Um, and in September of last year, we announced our roadmap where we plan to get to over 1,000 qubits uh, within the next now two years. Um, the, I think the key thing here is that when you start to get over a thousand qubits, then, the, um, then there are problems out there, especially in the area of materials, uh, material science, which begin to become tractable, depending obviously on the constraints of, uh, coherence time and error rates in the qubits, but we're getting close to the point where, uh, there are some tractable, tractable problems. We also outlined our path our roadway to uh, up to a million or millions of qubits um, by the end of this decade. And at that point, um, I think it's safe to say that quantum computing will be very much established, very much part of um, computational science, computational methods. The question then becomes, of course, um, how can we actually leverage that? How can we actually use that? And uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we uh, released our uh, software roadmap where we basically outlined um, how uh, we see software development in the context of quantum computing evolving. Uh, today, you can access quantum computers for free um, in uh, IQX, um, IBM's quantum experience, um, but you're accessing them at a, uh, at a circuit level. So you're actually uh, working with qubits and gates um, there are some uh, first, uh, let's say, algorithmic packages out there uh, based on circuit level, the circuit level abstraction. But we see this uh, expanding significantly in the coming years. And uh, we expect that in the time frame uh, after 2023, when we have 1,000 plus qubits, that um, a user of quantum computing will not necessarily be aware that the the engine under the uh, under the hood is actually a quantum computer or includes a quantum computer. That will be hidden by uh, different levels of abstraction. And I think this is also key in the sense of where do we see quantum computers being used? Um, the, the model we see is um, 
it's key to be able to work on using quantum computers to first of all uh, develop and um, uh, develop and progress the technology itself um, and this is what IBM is working on with our I think in the meantime over 140 members of the IBM Q network um, also key is to make those algorithms that we've developed uh, uh, IBM and our partners and others to make those available to a wider audience uh, moving forward and of course uh, a, 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 an easy to consume cloud model is is key there um, the um, where do we actually see this being used today so if we look at what our um, what our IBM Q network members are actually working on these are some examples of, of uh, topics that are being explored. Um, it, they range from you know, um, battery materials, um, um, optimization in manufacturing, um, um, classification of transactions, um, a number of uh, a number of use cases from the uh, financial services sector. Um, uh, product recommendation, labeling from uh, machine intelligence, fraud detection, um, with one of our partners um, working on random number generation, which is, is uh, key in, uh, in uh, simulation. Um, chemical problems or problems from chemistry, um, uh, a number of these, um, and variational uh, optimization methods and um, risk analysis and options pricing. And material degradation. I think the uh, uh, the key question then becomes um, what and how is that relevant for the energy um, industry, um, chemicals, petroleum, and energy in the wider sense. Um, and if you, I always like to say, if you if you take the the dimensions of material simulation. Um, artificial intelligence and uh, simulation and look at a company, an enterprise, and uh, ask yourself, where does their core value creation depend on one of these three dimensions? Um, you'd have to look very, very hard to find an enterprise somewhere on this planet where that's not the case. Uh, I think the impact of quantum computing is going to be massive in the long term. Um, we will see, um, of course, performance improvements in specific use cases, specific areas. But I think we will also see entirely new industries created and a, a massive disruption of existing industries. If we just take a look at, uh, at upstream energy, for example, um, we have the topic or the, 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 the issue of um, new power sources, of course, with um, the Kyoto uh, Agreement and uh, the mandate on um, self-energy generation. I know in Germany a very big, very big tof topic. This raises a number of significant challenges in uh, in managing that, uh, in managing supply and demand and distribution. These are combination combinatorial uh, optimization problems um, and uh, also present opportunities for uh, simulation scenario simulation. Um, the um if we look at how to um how to engage specific energy sources um looking at uh, energy caps market demand this is also uh, a, a very very difficult optimization problem and may well be something that uh, that uh, energy companies might want to look at um anything to do with scheduling resource allocation maintenance, um, uh, operational expense management. Um, these are also areas where we see, of course, optimization and simulation, um, and there may well also be um, some, some overlap there. Looking forward further into the future, um, the research into uh, chemistry using quantum computers, um, uh, specifically in the area of catalysts, um, in uh, carbon capture and a carbon capture economy, um, uh, the production of hydrogen, um, this, this may well represent uh, fruitful areas uh, for the application of quantum computing. 
Um, and um, of course, in the very far future, um, uh, if we think about um, micro power plants, self healing power plants, that kind of thing, um, that may also um, be of interest. If you look at the topic of downstream energy supply, um, the uh, what we see here is that some of the approaches um, being pursued in finance sector um, with portfolio management, um, risk management are quite similar to some problems in downstream energy supply, um, and it's you know it's 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 an open question as to whether. Um, those could be adapted, um, um, uh, transferred uh, into that into that new area. Grid supply, of course, also um, uh, a uh, significant challenge, um, and um, probably going to be something that where we can look at uh, optimization and scenario simulation. Um, going over to the end of the downstream, if you will, to the actual the consumer. Um, the um, prediction of consumer behavior, both uh, consumer, individual consumer, but also industrial consumers, um, and uh, applying predictive models to that. Um, there may well be some uh, some overlap, some, some potential there with quantum computers from the machine learning and artificial intelligence um, algorithms uh, area. And um, uh, energy conversion uh, also is, uh, is a potentially interesting area for further exploration. Um, and then the, the, the third kind of topic I wanted to just um, touch on was what about uh, quantum in um, areas which are kind of on the fringe of uh, the energy sector? Um, so if you look at what we've done with um, Daimler, Mitsubishi Chemical, um, simulating, so we're simulating the molecular interactions uh, um, in uh, batteries, in lithium uh, lithium oxide uh, batteries. Um, the um, a lot of our industry co industry customers are looking at um, uh, expanding their business models, um, uh, specifically into the area of. Um, data and usage of data there is also but significant potential there for for um, um, using optimization um, one further topic is of course the shale revolution um, the um, and this presents challenges both in terms of environmental impact and in terms of um, efficiency of extraction uh, cost of extraction and um, and then the final area, of course, is the whole area of climate, climate impact, climate prediction, uh, scenario analysis. So I, I, I just wanted to outline some some things we've already been doing, and some uh, uh, things where quantum computing in the future, moving forward, in the energy sector might uh, might find traction. Um, of course, it's not up to uh, to IBM to uh, to decide what uh, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Um, and I'd uh, you know invite everyone to have a think about that, and um, maybe in the discussion we're going to have now, we can touch on a few of these things. Um, I certainly hope that um, that uh, you'll all find um, fruitful ground for some uh, thoughts and uh, um, ideas on 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 some of those things. So with that, I'll close. A lot, Mark. Um... You know, I have an engineering background myself. I, I got a mechanical engineering degree, and uh, there's a lot of really complex and interesting problems in quantum in the technology in the first place, not even to mention the fact that we uh, we have figured out how to use it and how to apply it. Um, so definitely a lot of interesting challenges here that IBM is facing. So what I want to do now is bring on uh, some of our uh, industry folks who are going to help us uh, have this discussion. So I'll go ahead and introduce them as they jump on the video. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Detlef Hole. He's a uh, chief scientist for computation and data science at Shell. So thanks for joining us, Detlef. Um, next, I want to introduce uh, Jeremy First. He is a computational scientist at BP. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Prajesh Gupt, who is a research associate uh, here where I'm from in Austin at TAC. 
Uh, and finally, uh, Yuri Alexiev, who is a computational scientist at Argo National Labs. So I think we have a pretty broad swath of folks working both in research space uh, and doing research inside industry. Um, and so I'll pass it off to you guys uh, to start having the discussion. Yeah, great. Maybe, maybe I'll go first, Mark. Uh, fascinating presentation. Let me go first with a question that probably all of us in this group and maybe even at the conference have. You mentioned impact long term and you mentioned a lot of ambitions, but when can we expect quantum computing to progress from being fascinating science, which all of us in this group, I believe, agree it is, to doing useful science for us in the energy sector? For IBM, of course, the answer may be different for, for example, Shell, since you research and develop quantum computers and you may want to use them for that purpose. And you're also trying to find technologies that take you beyond semiconductor digital computers. But the problems in our domain are, of course, very different, say seismic imaging for carbon sequestration. I know of no way to use quantum computers for that. Catalyst and chemicals development, et cetera, and so forth. To the best of my knowledge, the largest chemistry molecule ever simulated on a quantum computer is the recent work by your competitor, Google, on a four atom molecule N2H2. So in other words, when can do when can quantum computing do something faster or cheaper or better than our current classical digital computers? And I'm satisfied with the or, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the answer is uh, um, an unequivocal, uh, I, I can't tell you. The, um, I think the, the best we can do is um, look at the our hardware roadmap or uh, competitors roadmap roadmap look at the um number of qubits that we uh, estimate we'll be able to you know put put on the on the racetrack uh in two years um and then of course the question then becomes you know what can you do with uh 1100 qubits with the corresponding coherence time um, are there any real problems you can solve? And I, I know that, and I, um, that's basically, that's the question that, um, customers who join the IBM quantum network, uh, are looking for answers to because that's their business problem. Um, and what may be right for shell may be wrong for BP or maybe, um, completely useless for a pharmaceuticals company or, or maybe not. Um, what we do see is. Um, and you know, I repeatedly, repeatedly get, I would almost say shocked by the speed of progress and the development of quantum algorithms. Um, the, um, you know, what can we measure? Which molecules can we measure and to what precision? Um, you mentioned N2H2. Um, there are ways of course, to, uh, to to measure or model much more complex molecules based on the Hamiltonian representation. Um, I'm not a chemist, so I couldn't tell you how to do that. I think the, uh, I think the, the key point is unless you, unless you actually try stuff and actually work with real quantum computers with noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, um, and work on developing algorithms, it's difficult to say when uh commercialization will be right for you um so it's, it's not possible to give a uh, you know a definitive answer to your question detlev um all i'd say is um f based on what's happened in recent years um and in the, the german phrase the the train is leaving the station uh, it's time to get a ticket so if i can if i can do a follow-up question on that uh, can you hear me Yes, yes. Yeah. So, like you said, the actual commercialization of uh, a quantum computer for these industries might take some time and like, we don't even know when, when that might happen. So in the meantime, uh, how do you hope or expect uh, to engage partners like uh, BP or Shell? Um, I mean, 
you would you would like them to you know somehow engage in the research or in the development of uh, the algorithms not wait for 10 years to uh, for the te for technology to become available and then use it right yes i mean um you you obviously the announcement from a couple of weeks ago about bp joining the ibm q network you're familiar with that um uh, exxon mobile who have uh, been one of the earliest uh, um earliest customers mitsubishi Chem mitsubishi chemical as well there's obviously significant interest in using quantum computers to simulate uh, quantum mechanical systems um and i would say the if we look at a typical you know how does that work typically there is a a meeting of minds in the sense of um uh, how does a technology actually work? How does a how does a quantum computer actually work? How can I actually use it? Um, obviously, you can you can learn about Hadamard gates and and C not gates and uh, Toffoli gates and uh, all the rest of it. It doesn't really give you um, uh, deep insight. It, it shows you how to program. The real work starts when you start when you begin to take what you've been doing classically and translate it into quantum. Uh, quantum computing uh, terms. I'm a, I'm a, um, uh, my PhD was in uh, information theory. And uh, a signature moment for me personally was when I decided in a moment of, uh, of, of rash uh, over enthusiasm or enthusiasm to re-examine my PhD and maybe rewrite it, rewrite the core algorithms to run on a quantum computer. And I followed six months of uh, scratching my head and banging my head against the wall, but I did learn a lot. And I finally came up with, uh, let's say, the quantum mechanical or the quantum computing equivalent. That process is very important. That process of understanding um, domain specific problems in a way that allows you or will allow you to um, to execute them on a quantum computer. That is key. The um, the that domain specific knowledge though is with you as a as a member of the IBM Q network one aspect we also see here as key is the is the cross fertilization so this is an ecosystem we have 100 over 140 members or around 140 members um, this isn't just a one way street of IBM providing quantum computing resources and you know you go away and do your stuff there is cross fertilization. There is there are ideas being exchanged between IBM and the network members in both directions, but also between network members and the, uh, um, among each other. So, and that's that's absolutely key, um, and that's going to be key to the long term future of being able to exploit and use the technology success successfully. I think if you wait, you know, waiting is always an option. Um, all I can say is. Um, I've been in the IT industry for 36 years. Um, when I came to IBM in 1989, so 31 years ago, I was a midwife to the brand new World Wide Web. Um, if I look at quantum computing now and the, the disruptive potential it has, I would consider it to be similar to or maybe even greater than the web. Um, if you'd... Uh, and, and the question, you know, then becomes uh, um, <laughs> who was in it the, on the web on e-commerce at the very start um, and who wasn't? Um, and then uh, draw your own conclusions about whether it makes sense to wait or not. The answer is always, I think, always no. Don't wait. Thanks. So uh, how do you think or what mode of, uh, you know, availability of quantum processing units or, you know, quantum computers might be as opposed to the clusters that we have today for instance like all big companies or big partners have their own clusters so the access to uh, quantum computers would it be via cloud for like next next 10 20 years or uh, you would be able to install one of these uh, hardwares to you know locally at um, at the site of of, of a client or a partner for that matter um well We've we've just installed and commissioned a uh, um, quantum computer in Germany, uh, not very far from where I am right now in uh, south of Stuttgart. Um, it's it's running in a, an IBM compute center because um, 
Um, obviously, the the business end is at 10 millikelvin. Um, there is some tender loving care that needs to take place on a regular basis to keep it there. But essentially, um, uh, and that, that's because of the superconduct. Most most engineered qubits are superconducting. Not all, but most of them. Um, that's not that's not rocket science. Um, low temperature uh, operating low temperature equipment is something that um, you know a lot of uh, medical practices, but also a lot of universities can do. Um, the barrier to the barrier to, to be able to do that is uh, not inherently high. Um, so we may, you may see at some point in the future, you know, in the, in the compute center, a, a quantum computer. Um, I think for the foreseeable future, for the next few years, it's going to make much more sense because the technology is evolving so quickly sure. to have, to have those, uh, to have that, that resource available via a provider who's responsible for, you know, ha making sure you have the, the bare, the latest and greatest, um, and that everything's running smoothly, but. There's no fundamental reason why it shouldn't, uh, at some point, move into the your own uh, compute center. Oh. Yeah. One about, thing you may, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Please go ahead. I was gonna. I was gonna uh, follow up with that uh, along those lines. In modern compute centers, we achieve fast computation by having hundreds of thousands of computers, rather than one computer with with hundreds of thousands of, of processors on it. Do you do you see quantum computers following that same trajectory where they're going to be rooms full of quantum computers interconnected with some quantum network or do you see the the chips themselves scaling up um i think it's going to be both um there and there, there are you've touched on a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of different uh, um related topics there the quantum internet um so um uh, linking Linking the uh, coherent state of qubits, maybe in one uh, cryostat with a coherent state of qubits in another cryostat, the, if you want the the, the holy grail of uh, of getting large number of qubits, a lot of uh, a lot of people working on that, um, making the qubits physically smaller, <clears throat> making the integrating electronics, <clears throat> excuse me, integrating the control electronics. So it's either on the chip or very, very close to the chip. Uh, at the moment, if you look inside a, a typical quantum computer, um, we try and put as much of this, the control electronics close to the qubits. Um, if you're working at superconducting uh, temperatures, it's actually quite a challenge. Electronics below a few Kelvin is, is not trivial. Um, I think what we're going to see is all of these things happening. We will see a, um, um, an overlay of all these different things, and um, that will uh, eventually, hopefully, get us to millions of qubits by the end of the decade. And we're pretty confident about that. In the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that the coherence time at the moment of the qubits that we have, uh, that we have devices with hundreds of qubits and with approximately 100 microseconds of coherence time. So, I mean, in terms of uh, speed, like uh, for a classical processor, we measure the speed as in like uh, in, a, in a second, a classical processor can do like a bunch of billions of floating point operations. So uh, to, to draw an analogy, like uh, how, do, how should someone understand this number 100 microsecond of uh, coherence time? And how do you see that evolving uh, over the next five, 10 or whatever years? So the, I think there are, um... There are two aspects here. The first is the um, the fact that physical qubits implemented in silicon or any other technology do have a coherence time. Um, sooner or later, a, a cosmic ray or um, some thermal energy, something's going to cause the qubit to lose coherence. Um, and there are two things that uh, two things that will basically improve that the first one of course is lower temperatures um uh, better refrigerators better screening better isolation um the cosmic ray thing is a kind of uh, um doesn't go away it doesn't matter how well you screen anything uh, you've still got cosmic rays but but essentially you can you know you can you can push things uh and along those dimensions the other th the other aspect if you like is um 
can we get to uh, the point where we have um, we're able to observe a partial quantum state and use that observation uh, to um, to correct the remaining quantum state uh, translated into uh, simpler terms can we do error correction um, if we can do error correction then we uh, have potentially a way to do um, to artificially extend coherence time in other words um, we may well then have access to um, error free or error corrected I want to see error free error corrected qubits um, that's also something that we're working very actively on and are um, moving towards ever ever closer towards. So I think those two things will be will will influence that and and move it forward. Right. So in terms of like uh, 100 microseconds at the moment, uh, how many gate operations can we do in that uh, in that time? Like uh, in terms of uh, the speed of these quantum processes? It's it's uh, the, the math. I think it's a it's a. a cup, cup couple of 10,000 gate operations. Well, yeah. it's actually, no, it's, 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 uh, it's depends on what, which gates. So, uh, you know, some gates are, uh, comp some gates are, if you can make them more efficient. Um, and also there's another aspect of that, of course, is which gates you actually physically implement in hardware. If you can do more <laughs> complex gates in hardware, then, um, Maybe you can speed things up and get more out of your coherence time. So it's it's a two prong. That's a, 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 a pincer uh, attack. Right. It depends what kind of gates and technology you're using, right? Uh, right. Range of possible operations is typically between hundreds and tens of thousands. Um, let me ask a different question. As a good engineering community, we've done what we always do, right? We focused on hardware in this discussion. What the hardware looks like. Are when a couple of quantum computers in two different refrigerators, which to my knowledge today hasn't been done yet. But I'm more interested, and maybe the community is also more interested in the software angle to it. Um, how is programming a quantum computer on the user end going to be different from programming a regular digital computer? Where we've accumulated, of course, decades worth of experience. Um, I'm assuming that the programming model on one hand would have to be quite different because the underlying hardware is different. On the other end, we're still going to be executing sequences of instructions to solve a problem. Can you comment on that a little bit? Maybe also everybody else in the group, how you see that? Well, uh, maybe I should let uh, somebody else uh, uh, say something. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, as far as uh, my experience goes, uh, Developing this full stack software uh, for quantum processor is exactly in that direction. I mean, the efforts are underway to make sure that uh, in future, whenever uh, a, a software engineer wants to access quantum uh, quantum uh, hardware, that per, that engineer has to do minimal work to you know uh, to translate uh, their code to to the quantum processor and. I mean, people people are spending time in building this bridge between the already developed ideas in uh, classical computing, software engineering, and the new upcoming, uh, you know, quantum software. So, I think, uh, I mean, my hope and and what I have uh, experienced is that it's not going to be as hard as one one would be thinking. So, but I might be wrong. I'd agree with that. Um, That's an interesting response because it, of course, leads me to challenging you on your original statement from a few minutes ago that waiting is not an option because of us in the industry, energy industry, we buy and we use market technology. We don't develop semiconductor technologies. We use market technologies and we have limited resources. So we have to make decisions where we put our limited resources into. And then if the programming model isn't all that different, explain to us one more time why waiting is not an option. Uh, okay, thank you for the, uh, the very good question. And uh, my answer is quite simple. <clears throat> um, the, um, on the hardware level, where we have superconducting Josephson junctions, we fire microwave pulses at them, 
we try and get them as cold as possible. We're dealing with, you know, refrigeration, cryostat, uh, photon phonon transduction, et cetera, so all these sort of things. That's a very, very low level. And if you like, that's the, you know, when I learned my computer science back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, um, working with bit slice machines and the very first field programmable gate arrays, which believe it or not actually existed back then, that was the, that was the really sort of, uh, um, you know, get, get your, get your hands dirty, messing around in the guts of the processor level. Um, that, that level will also exist in quantum computing and it will stay. We will always be working on making the technology better at the, the highest level, the apps, the, the, what we call modules, where really you're talking about solving a business problem where you're talking about solving a computational problem. We uh, expect that the fact that there is a com quantum computer under the hood will become um, at some point, uh, I wouldn't say maybe, tr maybe even transparent, but you certainly it won't be something that you're worrying about directly. Consuming quantum computing resources is going to become like consuming uh, um, a GPU or FPGA resources in a, in a high performance computing setting. The reason you can't wait is the layer between them, development of algorithms. And the development of algorithms depends on your specific use cases, your specific problems in an industry. And uh, as I said before, you know, the specific problems that, uh, that uh, Exxon or Shell or BP have, have will be different. You will each have different, different problems and different ways of looking at things and a different take on how you want to do them. Um, in order to be able to capitalize on that highest level, you have to have done the work in the middle. You have to have helped develop those, uh, those algorithms, those, those methods. Um, and no, I'll stop selling now. <laughs> you will need to rebuild the algorithm from the ground up though. If you're going to have, you won't get an advantage from taking a classical algorithm and putting it on a quantum computer. Is, is no. that correct? Yeah. So, so you have to you have to get you have to redesign the algorithm from the bottom up to to get any advantage once you put it on the quantum computer. Well, there is there is of, of course there is a lot of um, a lot of stuff, a lot of work's already been done uh, on variational methods, um, which are particularly useful in uh, simulation. Um, and assuming we get to error corrected quant qubits in the near future, then uh, on some um, some. Uh, ideal qubit algorithms, Shor's algorithm and derivatives of that. If we take Shor's algorithm as an example, so Peter Shor, I think it was in 1994, came up with the idea of translating factoring um, an integer into um, basically finding, um, finding the harmonics uh, in, um, in quantum space, if you will, in Hilbert space. Um, and I, I, isolating or extracting those harmonics using the quantum Fourier transform. Very, very clever guy, genius piece of work. Um, we then, we being, I would say the, the theoretical computer science world realized this, that this was a special case of the hidden subgroup problem. They then began a, a really a significant push into extending the fundamental principles of using uh, identifying repetition to solve more um, more ex more expansive or more complex variants of the hidden subgroup problem. That's that kind of approach is something you see in quantum algorithm development. There will be a a, a discovery of a particular principle and then an extension and an extension and an extension and an extension of that. The um, so it's not it's not a tabula rasa. It's not a you know blank board where you have to s literally start from scratch. There is a lot of uh, there are a lot of algorithms out there, but the development of new algorithms is a very very fertile area of research. There's an awful lot going on. We see we monitor the um, the uh, world of uh, scientific literature in quantum computing. Uh, I don't know the exact figure, but it's 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 several scientific papers per month, maybe even per week, on algorithm development alone. There's an awful lot happening. Um, so don't, you know, don't, don't wait, <laughs> keep saying it. Yeah, it absolutely I can add here, uh, this is Yuri Alexey from Argon. Uh, 
in my opinion, it's too risky not to invest in quantum computing. That's, I think, the message here is that because the te technology itself has a, uh, I'll say, explosive potential. And uh, this is like, we has, if, if you look at, anyway, you look, it has this, this exponential kind of like curve uh, in terms of uh, computational requirements, what actual computational problems it can solve. Uh, it is also exponentially hard aspect to <laughs> design, it seems like, to hardware as well. But the problem is that this technology is not linear in both algorithmical space and hardware space. And you, you can imagine, imagine easily a scenario where this technology will become relevant and very useful on very, very short term. At the same time, it may take actually uh, many years. So from that perspective, I would say uh, it makes complete sense to, uh, to at least, at least uh, to invest at least a little bit of time and efforts in quantum, uh, in the quantum computing in general. So that's my perspective. If I, could, if I could follow up on that, there seems to be two branches of types of algorithms that are pushed for, for quantum advantage. There's variational algorithms, which work well on our, our noisy devices we have now, but then there are I don't, more robust algorithms that don't that aren't as robust to noise, but give you a more accurate example. Should should energy companies be investing in in algorithms for these these uh, error corrected devices that will be coming in the next couple of years, or do you think we should be investing in the short term NISC type algorithms, like variational algorithms, uh, to to try and capitalize on short term advantages? Yeah, so that's a very good question, <laughs> and uh, and very controversial. Uh, depending on whom you ask, you can get very, very, very different answer uh, to this. Uh, I have experience with both working in quantum chemistry and combinatorial solving combinatorial optimization problems. I would say, uh, out of all applications, all algorithms that Mark mentioned, that you can certainly put them on a scale. Some of them actually much more feasible compared to actually some of them maybe you can be like really many really decades away. Um, and it's it's kind of tricky to figure out which one is going to be closest and uh, and what actual hardware. Uh, and I mean, if it makes sense to run it, optimize it for current hardware. I can tell you maybe from working on this field for quite a while, trying actually to run something useful on the current existing hardware is extremely challenging. That's for sure. I mean, there is a, there is a distinct difference, right, between trying to de develop algorithms uh, uh, that are going to be relevant, like in decades from now, or what is actually right now. We are very, very, very different beasts. Uh, and it, unfortunately, I think it, because, because it depends on the algorithm itself, it's very hard to give a very general answer to it. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, I can tell you maybe my perspective, and I'm very biased, and, uh, and probably Mark has a very different perspective. I personally uh, prefer working uh, working on combinatorial optimization problem space, just because the Hamiltonians that we use with Eisen Hamiltonians, they are quite simple, quite straightforward. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge developed back from U-Wave days, right, when we have these annealers. And uh, it seems like we can actually capitalize on this, uh, this knowledge to kind of actually make some progress, a lot of progress. And in general, I would say uh, algorithmical space, solving these uh, problems, combinatorial optimization problems, it seems like a lot of progress has been done in this area. I'm talking about QAA algorithms in recent years. So yeah, I agree. I mean, it seems like there's two categories, as you mentioned, Jeremy, that we should look at. One is the variational type algorithms, and one is those that rely on error corrected quantum computing. Now, the theory of error corrected quantum computing is relatively well developed, and it points in the direction of needing a lot of overhead. So, for each error corrected qubit, you need somewhere between 100 and 1,000 real qubits. When we look at a Mark's projection of a thousand qubits, which I believe is already very ambitious in a couple of years. That means we had maybe uh, two or 10 
real qubits era corrected. So that seems a direction that's from a hardware perspective relatively far away. And observing what's happening in the variational space, there seems to be a lot of progress indeed with algorithms. I mean, even to the point that algorithms have been developed, quantum inspired algorithms that are realizable on zero qubits, right? You don't really need a quantum computer to implement Tang's algorithm for recommender systems. He, he implemented it on a regular computer for exponential gain. So algorithm research is indeed something that I'm very much in favor of. I'm very excited about what's happening in that area. To further add to Jeremy's earliest question, uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, the paradigm of quantum computing is going to be, if, if not always for a, for a foreseeable future, it's going to be a hybrid model. That is classical, one cannot completely, you know, replace classical computers by quantum computers. So, I mean, we need both, I mean, expertise from both fronts, like from classical engineering and quantum engineering, they're coming together in a synergistic way to, you know, make progress. For instance, uh, I mean, at the moment, I mean, uh, in the absence of error corrected, error corrected codes and fault tolerant quantum computers, we have, you know, NISC algorithms, such as variational algorithms and so on and so forth. And uh, on the on the classical side, as uh, as Detlef mentioned, uh, we have quantum inspired classical algorithms. So, I mean, if for the next five to ten years at least, uh, this kind of uh, you know exchange of ideas is going to take place, and hopefully going to generate uh, you know uh, progress on both fronts. I think uh, looking at the time here, I think that's a great spot to end in, uh, Prajesh. That's a really good summary, actually, of where we're at, right? Over the next few years, we're going to have to take what we know from classical computing and apply it to quantum and, and take the best from each and apply it to each other. And, and we're all learning. I think uh, this is the time to invest both perhaps in infrastructure, but also just in education. And I'm glad that everyone here was able to help uh, those of you who are watching to learn more about quantum and how it might affect the energy sector. Uh, I would be amiss if I didn't send you somewhere to learn more. IBM.com slash quantum is where you can go to learn more about what IBM does in quantum. And as far as our participation here at the conference, we, of course, have a virtual booth. And you can also check out uh, another area of research that came out of our IBM research group, uh, IBM's Bayesian Optimization Accelerator product, which is specifically for HPC clusters and basically using the old method of, of Bayes' theorem uh, to speed up the HPC process uh, and finding good solutions. So I encourage you to go check out the session on that and learn more about that as well. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers and, and panelists here. Uh, thank you to everyone, especially thank you to Mark for giving us uh, the introduction to all of these topics. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the conference. And if you have any further questions or anything that you want to discuss, it looks like there's a pretty broad group of people who want to talk about quantum. So thanks to everyone for participating and thank you for watching. <laughs>